Hello and welcome to the NAFTA Movie Review. I'm Evil Dex, our Canadian, and I'm joined by Wally, American. Hello. And Rain, our Mexican. <laughs> Hello. Today we're uh, going to be talking about a movie that needs very little introduction, Raiders of the Lost, Steven, directed by Steven Spielberg, which is the first Indiana Jones movie, spawning a large, very long-running series. Probably just about anybody listening to this has seen it before. So I won't say any more about it, and we'll... Uh, Go straight into our opinions on it. Starting with you, Rain. So, hello, I'm Rain. Rain. And um, so, I, this is in, was my first time seeing like, Raiders of the Lost Ark. But I'm uh, very, very, very fond of this film. And looking back at it again after several years without seeing it, it, it was a, a very nice session for me. Um, I, I, I quite like, this is my favorite of the, all the Indiana Jones movies, since they, they are for them to date, but uh, I really don't like the last one. But the original trilogy, the, last one. <laughs> <laughs> the original trilogy is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's very entertaining. But for me, the the best of them still the first one, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, it's a very campy uh, action adventure film about uh, Indiana Jones, who is an archaeologist, who is a archaeologist, who's in this case they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Which was used by the Hebrew, the Israel, Hebrew people in the the Old Testament times, as uh, where, as the Bible puts it, that God's spirit would rest with them and accompany them. So uh, it's very, very, very fun film. I think it's even though it's some of the special effects have noticeably aged, they're still done, not that overused or not that. Uh, they don't stand out that much, I would just say, like a, a modern CGI fest, <laughs> where, where you can really notice where there are not no sets or no, no kind of practical effects, practical special effects. They're they're, they're still uh, very much uh, enjoyable. Uh, so the fight sequences are very campy, <laughs> these like kind of uh, punches where they have a to strong a sound effect for it. Or the, the, how the characters would go out playing, but it, it's very fitting with the, the the spirit of the film, and I I am very fond of Indiana Jones as a character. He's very consistent. He he is very much a, a guy that wants to recover relics for them to be the as the most quoted probably, uh, but he's has said that it belongs in a museum to keep them preserve and for the benefit of everyone rather than it be misused or sold off in the black market so he is he's a pretty big kind of that kind of well Harrison Ford plays another character with that isn't exactly that much of a good guy but he's still pretty lovable and you can root for him for what he's fighting for so uh, I, I'm I very much love this film so Wally Yep, so um, Wally or Wallenstein. Um, this, for me, I've seen this film at least a dozen times. Uh, I've seen it as a kid. Uh, this is definitely one of those movies that if you were to ask someone what a blockbuster film is, this is easily one of the ones that probably instantly crops to people's minds. Um, this also uh, is one that probably a lot of people... Uh, give credit to getting them interested in or actually getting them wanting to take careers in things like archaeology and history, uh, especially when it first came out. Um, I've listened and read to countless interviews of people saying, you know, this is Harrison Ford or uh, Indiana Jones is the one reason that got me into, you know, whatever their historical field was. Um, and as Raim said, this is definitely campy. Uh, this isn't, you know, super serious. Uh, historical film by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it's one of those ones that, you know, as a kid, I enjoyed watching it, uh, loved it to death. Uh, this, I probably will say, also is my favorite of the Raiders trilogy. I've never seen the fourth one, and I probably don't care to see the fourth one, just from what I've heard about it. Um, but yeah, it's everything about it uh, between the very catchy theme, although to be fair, anything John Williams does probably is catchy. 
yeah. and just the character of uh, Indiana Jones being kind of this, you know, that one end of the spectrum, kind of this geeky but adorable and kind of heartthrob history professor, but yet then the other end of the spectrum, you know, it's almost like a Clark Kent Superman type of thing when, you know, he takes the tie off and stuff, he goes and kicks ass and, you know, saves the world type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, this is definitely a classic when it comes to both, I think, blockbusters and just kind of your campy action adventure um, movies. Uh, the other thing, too, I note, too, I think, Rami, you mentioned this, is that this is probably the one time, although even though Spielberg was the director, this is the one set of movies that Lucas didn't like, you know, re reamp the special effects by introducing more CGI into it, like he did with the Star Wars films, mm -hmm. which I think is nice because it still has that kind of practical effects that make it still a bit charming even today, even though it, some of it is a bit dated. But yeah, I think it definitely stands on its own. All right, so me next. Um, I'm the only one of the three of us that was watching this for the first time now. I just somehow it slept me by through my entire childhood, although I have, of course, seen some of Spielberg's other films like Titanic and Minority Report and the Star Wars movies, which had George Lucas, who was the creative director, I believe, on this film. I like it. I quite liked it. I would echo the sentiment of the practical effects, even though in some places they're dated. I think I remember a particular scene where there's like a overcast sky background that looks pretty obvious and out of place. Um, I would still much rather have this approach to action filmmaking than the super CGI heavy stuff that we see a lot of today. Um, Andy Dan Jones is definitely notable for having a lot of classic movie moments. One that springs immediately to mind, of course, is the um, scene where the Arab swordsman uh, flourishes a sword around about to challenge Indiana Jones and gets shot and dies. And uh, of course, the classic snakes flying. Both those have pretty interesting film trivia surrounding them. Where uh, the snakes, for example, they had originally intended to use lions at one point, but they just picked, decided on snakes because it was cheaper, essentially. And of course, the um, Eric Swordsman was originally supposed to have a longer choreographed fight scene against Indy, but Harrison Ford was feeling under the weather that day, so he just shoot the guy instead. Um, one thing that I really appreciated was a late scene where Indiana Jones holds the bad guys at uh, rocket launcher point and the bad guy calls his bluff by saying that he's not willing to blow up the Ark of the Covenant because of its historical value. I think that was a nice scene. It made me like sort of like Indiana Jones more than a lot of other action characters. We would have been much more pragmatic about that. It was nice to give him sort of almost that weakness and give him a little more human. Um, and I kind of liked how the villains defeat themselves through their own hubris overconfidence in general. I think that's a nice story moment. Um, yeah, the, the one thing that makes me feel a little bit more reserved in my overall is that the storyline is, I would say, fairly typical Hollywood blockbuster for the most part. It's not that exciting, not really going to win any creative writing awards exactly. But uh, otherwise, I think it's really good. Uh, John Reese Davies is in this film as a supporting character. I really liked him. I really liked his character. Ever rated as a three star out of on Letterbox D, I think I consider upping it, especially on a rewatch, because I find that um, the first time I watched some of these films, a lot's not that strong, but many of the technical aspects of the filmmaking are really good. I'll start to appreciate those aspects more and more as I continue to watch them. Yeah, that's about all I have to say on it. Yeah, so we are going. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I think uh, since we're given our, our thoughts, we can enter a. Uh longer discussion about this and just wanted to comment on and what that that scene that you mentioned where Andy is 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 a, he has this this bazooka and, and he's like uh, pointing Belloc the like his main antagonist throughout the, the entire film and uh, and then I, I like that kind of consistency with with his Andy that he's very much willing to to sometimes uh, either like not go ahead with his plan or leave someone behind if he needs to in order to save the arc. Like when he is, he he's he has Marion and he he has found he, she has been captured and he has found her again, but they think he, he's dead. So he, so he's like, uh, I did, did, oh, I'm sorry, I did think that they they, they think that he she, he thinks that she's dead and. And he's like, well, I'm not going to rescue you because if I rescue you now, they're going to know that I'm here and I, I need to find the ark. 
and, and that kind of like it, it, uh, you expect so usually like the hero is going to be like oh no I'm going to save you at all costs and also save the arc and he's not like no I'm uh, I'm going to leave you here and, and come back for you maybe later but but the arc is more important right now so it, when the Bella calls his bluff that he, he's not going to put all them all to bits including the arc it's really nice to see that Indy has been set up to be this guy that he wants to maintain the art because and I remember you commenting before that he destroys a bit the, the basically desecrates the temple where he finds the art but the circumstances are a bit uh, required more for it and it's not like he was trying to to really destroy it because in the end the art is probably yeah. more important so he's uh, he has to to do everything to go back to it. Right. So I don't I don't think that we should call consider that scene where he sort of destroys the temple wall to give away um, an inconsistency in his character because I doubt he was very happy to do that, but he definitely needed to, to survive in that situation. Yeah, and I think and I can't remember if it's in that film, but I think it's in some other in uh, Ra uh Raiders films uh, or Indiana Jones films where there's kind of like you can tell just from the camera shot or just from the music that that tension of him just unintentionally destroying some historical significant stuff is kind of it makes him uncomfortable um but yes i think that is a good point is that the consistency in his character is a sign of both good and consistent writing by the script writers that they didn't just resort to kind of this knee-jerk like superhero type of you know saves the, saves the damsel saves everyone and you know nothing nothing bad happens yeah. to them or there's no consequences so it's kind of refreshing as well, because normally, like Rain said, you would expect the hero to put the woman before all else. But in the Indiana Jones case, getting the job done and preserving historical relics is actually more important to him. He prioritizes it above that. Right. Yeah. Is that so an inter no, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, uh, not to, I'm just going to take a different tangent, but an interesting point, I think, in the films is that so through all three of the original films, uh, the Nazi regime are the quote-unquote bad guys, where I shouldn't say they're just the bad guys. Everyone knows they're the bad guys. It makes it for an easy um, antagonist because people already know going in that Nazis are bad, so you know not to root for those folks. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, historically, the Nazis really were obsessed with a lot of these artifacts, particularly of biblical origin, although that's not so much the Nazis, it was just Germans in general, because prior to uh, the 20th century, uh, the Germans were very much well known for their archaeological uh, finds and their contributions to the study. Uh, but like most things the Nazis touched, it kind of mutated and into this grotesque kind of um, obsession with uh, whatever they have for their own nefarious needs um so that that i think there's that little historical touch too that at least even though it is camped up it definitely it does have that touch of historical accuracy in there which i i appreciate yeah it's nice when a film um gives you that basis to sort of springboard off and read more about history or become more interested in it so i didn't know about this um monomania that they have regarding old historical artifacts before this conversation so it's kind of nice to have that now yeah, I, I mentioned when we watched the movie, the evil text that I, you would probably... Yeah, I think it gets, it, it gets, it gets discussed in the film a little bit as well. I think. The character's talking about Hitler having an obsession with these things. Yeah, the, I, in, in my case, the, I think it's also the details regarding the art and and, uh, and everything. Like It's actually... Like, they're very consistent with what is said in the Bible. I mentioned that uh, there's this story where... Yeah, King David in the Bible, he's bringing back the Ark of the Covenant to the temple, and then uh, they're well, they're carrying the the priests are carrying the the, and they they they're bringing this in a in this like this wheelbarrow or something, and they're all dancing and everything, and because it's, they're dancing and, and while they're moving like through this hill, then it, it it begins to shake and the Ark of the Covenant seems to be about to fall, so this random soldier. He places out his hand to try to stop the Ark of the Covenant from falling, but uh, according to the Bible, only the the Levite, um, Levite priests, the, the Levite priests were the only ones that were allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant, as the, it was a holy object, and only those who were like uh, purified and in constant communion will be able to at least carry it. 
uh, anyone else was forbidden to do so. So in the Bible, in this story, when this soldier tries to stop the Ark of the Covenant, uh, lightning strikes him and he, he dies immediately. And, uh, okay. and uh, I, I like the detail because it, at the end of the film, when when uh, they, they're doing this ritual and they open the Ark, uh, um, and every, everyone that starts basically like obliterating this uh, race of energy. So it's, it's I think it's a, a, an actually good representation of how it, <laughs> anyone that it's not the Levi Prince will, will will die if they touch the Art of the Covenant. So the uh, I, I thought that this was very good because the Art of the Covenant in the in the Bible is actually also like a a pretty coveted uh, artifact. Whenever the like the the Philistines will will try to to take the Ark from the Israeli people, the Hebrew people, then they will also like get cursed. There's the, there's a story where they once take the Ark and. They, uh, apparently like a tumor grows in their testicles so they just like give it back yes. because it, it's not worth the trouble so basically anyone that is not uh, intended to have the ark it's, it's cursed and and those that uh, were like appointed to have it in the airplane so I, I think it's it's very nice to see like at the end how the, the as people take say the hubris takes down the the nazis because... right so I think we can agree on is that it seems like a lot of um, research went into the movie, well planned out and thought out. Yeah, research and they at least treated the source material with kind of this respect, like I said, despite it being campy, although that brings up a funny point, an ironic point. I remember uh, one of my former history professors and I had this discussion, not about Indiana Jones, but about another um, historically based film is that, especially going back further with some of the older films, the less serious, um historical films are the the more historical accurate they tend to be whereas a lot of like especially today's films when they try and like advertise that it's based on you know this true story based on there's a lot of gaps and in historical inaccuracies that at least for me make kind of me you'll hear me have like an audible groan when i'll see it whereas in this film it's even though like i said it is very fictionalized it is very campy at least knows the source material enough to at least take it seriously Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point because you can kind of, um, if it's a comedic or lighthearted work, you can actually use circle and accurate. It can be kind of excused through a sort of poetic license where if it makes it funnier, it's okay to deviate from history. But the uh, more sensationalized, like serious ones, you have, don't really have that excuse. So it's funny that they would uh, slap. Right, and I guess uh, for an example I can give is the one, the um, probably the most grotesque one or maybe not grotesque as a poor choice of words, but the most obvious one. For me, one yeah, yeah, the most egregious one for me would be in Braveheart, where you have basically all the Scots in battle wearing nothing but kilts and um, like no armor or whatever. And that just every time I see that scene, I just groan. Actually, I think I have read some stories about like Pictish warriors naked and they would just paint themselves for intimidation purposes or something like that. Although I haven't. Well, that's. That's way, way, way back. That's like Roman times and pre-Roman times. I mean, this, okay. this we're talking medieval period. The Scots did wear armor. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I think Braveheart, so that's my ignorance. Well, I think, too, Mel Gibson's excuse was that the whole movie was based off of a poem about William Wallace and not yeah. the actual like historical. And I think that's his excuse for me. Uh, that's not good enough. But that <laughs> uh, we're getting off topic now. Yeah, no. That um, yeah, actually, I, uh, Indy does really like, a, a, as you mentioned, it has a lot of respect for, for what it's basing itself on, and uh, I, just like a, um, a comment, there does seem to be. It's, it's nice that to see that in the third movie, which is the, the Last Crusade, they also bring back that kind of uh, obsession that they, they had with the, now with the Holy Grail, even though that's. Uh, <laughs> Also brings out uh, some more outside biblical aspects, but uh, yeah, it's 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 really nice when they they do consider a lot, a lot of points of and they tr try to to be respectful and reasonable when, with the, despite taking some liberties and and not being right, and open about being it's it's it based on right and to, for Last Crusade to reemphasize your point is that they even treat it intelligently like so the very end scene of 
Yeah. Well, I'm not, oh, are, we, are we going to be seeing it? Or am I spoiling? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Oh, no, that's okay. I don't know if it, but like the, say for Evil Dicks in case it's unseen. No, that's the, okay. The very last scene when you know they're deciding what what Chalice should be, they're very intelligent on how they do that. It's not you know the big grandiose, uh, fancy gold plated cup. It's you know what was Jesus of Nazareth? He was a carpenter or son of a carpenter so it's going to be the like least obvious least ostentatious one and i, I think that at least treating it intelligently also is a um very pleasing aspect in these films yeah i also like that very much the fact that they didn't go like oh this is the holy grace so it's meant to be like a majestic like king of david or king of solomon it's it's not it, jesus wasn't uh <laughs> like uh, uh, an earth king, earth king, he was just, as you mentioned, son of a carpenter. So it's that's a very, very nice detail that they, that they put into it. Yeah. Okay. So although it's an unrelated point, that um, reminds me of the final scene in Raiders: of The Lost Ark, where um, it's revealed that the Ark of the Covenant is now, I believe, under control of the American government, and they've got it stored away in some kind of facility where they're holding tons and tons of other artifacts. Yeah, that's very it's probably very what? classic scene that's become like almost a meme that's been yeah parodied in other yeah i saw the family guy version of it before i saw the real version yeah there's family guy i'm pretty sure the simpsons have done it too at some point um but yeah it's very very famous so it's like i said it's essentially a meme at this point in yeah. cinema well that's a worthwhile one to talk about because it brings up a few thematic ideas that the story has about that kind of corruption how things um of that nature might end up being misused by bureaucrats or such, even outside of the hands of the Nazis. Well, yeah, it's very much um, kind of painting this grayish picture that, you know, just because Indiana Jones, quote unquote, saved the day, it doesn't mean that everything is all great and hunky dory. It's still, you know, it's almost bringing up the question like, OK, are, are the can the Americans be like just as bad as the Nazis in that case, whereas on you have the one, like I said, the grotesqueness of the Nazi obsession with obtaining these artifacts. You also have kind of, as you pointed out, this kind of overly bureaucratic, like mind-numbing, like, oh, well, just throw it in the corner and you know we'll get to it eventually type of thing. Yeah, so the film deserves some credit for introducing that kind of more complexity, even if it's only a little bit at the end, I would say. Yeah, it's... Uh... Well, Indy as as he's basically a professor of ecology first, and uh, so he 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 he's very much basically he, he makes his complaints known at the end about what what they chose to do with chose to do with it because he he knows he's also like basically uh, firsthand seeing the aftermath of what happens when the ark is misused, so he's, he he knows it's not to be taken lightly, and um. So yeah, it's it's very nice when the, the it's 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 still probably not in the best of hands. So what will happen then? And uh, yes, it definitely shows again. It reinforces Indiana Jones as a consistent character, um, and like and to the point where it has like the famous bureaucratic. So to his whole frustration of you know, as you said, he's witnessed what it's done, and not only that, he knows the historical importance of it to be responded with by the very typical bureaucratic we're taking care of it, don't worry about it, um, very much, I think, is, like I said, both consistent with Indiana's character and also reemphasizes that kind of gray uh, painting of, you know, the kind of ethics of the whole, bo of both sides of the conflict. I think uh, another point uh, regarding Indiana is that... Uh... As, as, as you, I really like that, that comment that you made that he's much like a, a Clark Kent guy, where he's uh, is a, is a professor that he's in very geeky and he's clearly like very much in love with the relics and, and keeping them preserved. But then when he's Indiana Jones, he's the, this, this, this badass guy that the, the people winning probably think first, like, yeah, this guy is a university professor. Okay. Almost literally, too, because his professor persona, if you can call that, has the glasses, you know, has the nice shirt and tie. And then it's almost as he literally, like, as soon as he takes the glasses off, it's suddenly he's the completely different person. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's, it speaks to me that uh, he, 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 
in the throughout the film actually has like a, a lot to to earn because at the start of the film he's in the in the Latin American jungle and uh, and he's trying to get, get back this this relic but then he's betrayed by he's trying to be betrayed by one guy and then by the other guy that which is played by Alfred Molina and, mm-hmm. and then when he's just out then there's Belloc that basically has one up him by speaking with the natives and 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 just taking it so he, he you 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 really wrote, wrote a lot a lot for the guy that starts to film in a that he tries, but he's basically one up by by his antagonist. Right. That's that brings up another point too. Is that in each of the Indiana, at least the three Indiana films, is that Indy's main primary antagonist isn't necessarily the Nazis, but some rival archaeologist who happens to just fall in with the Nazis. So I think in Raiders, I think Belloc is French, if I remember. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And then, like, just like I said, he's just a rival, but happens to fall in with the Nazis. Uh, I can't quite remember why, if it was just money or some other reason. Um, but that's another interesting point to uh, make is that, you know, it isn't just Indy versus the Nazi empire. It's Indy usually versus his rival, backed by the arm and the money of the Nazi empire. Yeah, so you can interpret Belk as kind of like a negative reflection of Indiana Jones, where he takes the obsession with. Archaeological, or archaeological relics to such significance that he sort of sells his soul to the Nazis to try and get to them. Right. Yeah, he's, he's very much like the anti indy in this case. Whereas Indy wants it to be preserved, but like, doesn't really mind like selling off the black market for money. <laughs> Which is what happens, I think, with, with what he mentions at the beginning of the, the price of the, the relic that, that Indy has <laughs> recovered at the beginning of the film. Right, and uh, I, I think I, uh, I also like uh, well as you mentioned that uh, anything done by John Williams is very iconic. But Indy has a very iconic team that he, he, when when it's played throughout the film, and, and you you can basically whistle it or keep it in mind. And say, oh yeah, that's Indiana Jones. I I miss a lot of that in in modern films because I feel there's it's very rare for like a, a film in that probably I, I, I can't think of one right now like the, the last 10 years the past decade that I would say like this character had a, such an iconic team that stayed with me and uh, Indiana Jones yeah. has a, a fairly memorable soundtrack and his team especially is, is certainly iconic I think that that also could be just the nature of blockbusters in general I think is that they tend to have the very catchy tunes the very memorable tunes um, which I think is just part of not just the talent of the composer or the composers, but just the nature of the beast in itself. It's just to get everything has to be very recognizable, very um, memorable. Uh, and I think that's also part of it because I think to your point, some of the more recent films I've seen, while I do like the scores and soundtracks of them they aren't necessarily like memorable that I'll be catching myself like whistling it or humming it. At any yeah. point. I think Skyfall's opening theme is probably the best example from the last 10 years or so for me. Yeah, yeah. I have. Uh, well, it's James Bond feels <laughs> I tend to have. It's yeah, it's usually. A... Opening themes. Even though there are uh, obviously <laughs> there are exceptions like yeah, Madonna's. Last, the last several James Bond films, with yeah, I would say the exception of Skyfall. To a certain extent, don't have particularly strong themes in my opinion. Sam Smith's one for Spectre is not that great. Yeah. Example. Yeah, but I like outside uh, at least um, established franchise franchises. There, are, there aren't like that many memorable teams that I can. I, I, I well, I can think not of that. right now, but uh, there really aren't. Right? Like the, yeah, the, no, the no, most no. the most recent one that comes to mind isn't like ten years ago, but almost twenty years ago, which is the Sam Raimi Spider Man. Okay, yeah. I, I think that that his team is is memorable, very good. Uh, that uh, Danny Elfman team, like the original uh, Batman team that he made. Yeah, so the ones that I can think of from recent memory are only the vocal pieces, not just the purely instrumental or orchestral ones. Like obviously Frozen. Like- would be another big example really stuck in the public consciousness right 
and sung in karaoke bars and stuff all the time. And that yeah, for me, yeah. the only one I can think of is Blade Runner 2049. Although to be totally transparent and fair, I've watched the film enough and listened to the soundtrack enough that that's probably the reason why it's memorable for me. And that I, cause I also love just the, um, whole lore and the whole, um, universe itself. So, yeah. And that has a synth sort of soundtrack, which is a genre of music you're very fond of. Isn't that right? Correct. Yes. It's very good. Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen Blade Runner 2049 yet. We could probably have that on a Fortnite, some kind of neo noir Fortnite. Or yeah, Cyberpunk Fortnite. Fortnite. Or a Cyberpunk, yeah. Probably. So uh, I think we did, uh, discuss like uh, now over three minutes. So we're probably given enough stuff. Yeah, right. I think that was yeah. definitely winding down. But so this is a fine place to end it, I'd say. Yep. Yeah. So thank you for listening, and hopefully you'll catch it next time. Yep. Goodbye. So long.